Welcome to Impact TV, a corporate venture video series in collaboration with the Kauffman Fellows. I'm Jack Crawford, a founding general partner at Impact Venture Capital, and alongside of my colleague from Impact, Pat Bumpus, and my Kauffman Fellow co-chair, Alessandro Santo, we're thrilled to welcome to the show, Gayatri uh, Radhan Krishnan. Uh, she's made it easy on the world by allowing me and others to call her G. How did I do on your last name, G? Uh, you, I'll give you a five out of 10, Jack. <laughs> I butchered it. Uh, so uh, G's a partner at Hitachi Ventures, and I was um, excited to develop a friendship with her. Uh, we went through the Kaufman Fellows uh, program uh, together, and so we got a chance to develop a friendship in that two-year program. Back then, you were at Dell, and uh, and since then, you went from sort of Dell to Micron to Hitachi, uh, now as a partner there at Hitachi Ventures. G, just tell us a little bit about you know the, the your, your background with three different corporate venture groups. Uh, sure. But when I was at Dell, I was more in the strategy and M&A function. So a uh, buyer of technologies or startups that VCs invested in, uh, not necessarily on the investing side, but I did work closely with the uh, then Dell Ventures team uh, from a business unit standpoint. So I used to be on the software division strategy and M&A side. Um, so it was fun. I, uh, since Dell, as you may remember, Jack, I also worked at two different startups where I was uh, head of product or VP of product management. Um, and then <clears throat> the most recent startup I was at um, went under. And as I was thinking about what's next, um, wanted to revert back to venture capital. I had I'd done VC almost 15 years ago um, at Early Bird Venture Capital. And with kind of the experience of having worked at a startup, having sort of uh, done strategy M&A at a large uh, sort of firm, um, I thought it would be a value add to be part of a corporate VC where I could bring some of my insights of having done institutional VC followed by um, also, you know, uh, the M&A side and having that startup experience. So given that, context, I uh, pursued an opportunity at Micron Ventures or the venture arm of Micron. Um, and I was there with them until recently. It's going to be close to a year now since I moved to Hitachi Ventures as a partner. You've just been a great supporter and collaborator. We've not only had an opportunity to co-invest, but I remember the days at Dell, we were running uh, the Impact uh, uh, Corporate Venture Summit and you were an early supporter as a sponsor and partner and speaker. And then we've had an opportunity to co-invest in some AI deals since then. From an industry sector standpoint, can you talk a little bit about Hitachi Ventures' focus? You know, there's certainly seems to be some focus on environment and energy and health and industrials, but maybe in your words, talk a little bit about the industry sector focus of where you're at now. Absolutely. So at Hitachi Ventures, I mean, Hitachi is a, a industrial giant, has been around for, um, you know, almost uh, more than a uh, more than 100 years now, if I'm not mistaken. So a uh, pretty well-established company. Um, we are the corporate venture arm, but we are set up more as an independent entity with Hitachi as a single LP in our fund. We tend to focus on sort of three broad verticals. Um, I think of it as industrial, uh, green and sustainability, and also healthcare. But horizontally, we look at any technology that enables digital transformation. So that's a pretty broad mandate uh, for us from that standpoint. And I personally focus on that horizontal, uh, the digital transformation piece. Okay. Our, our co-investments historically have been in some pretty interesting companies, obviously Task Human. Um, sort of AI in the digital health space to some degree and, and looking at health and wellness um, for uh, for corporate employees and for students and in a lot of different areas, sort of uh, a video coaching uh, platform that's really interesting. And then virtualness uh, was another uh, co-investment. Most of our focus has been on the AI side of things. And we're starting to look at how AI might influence our investment making and deal selection. Have you guys thought about that at all? How does Hitachi Ventures th sort of think about AI applied inside of Hitachi Ventures? Absolutely. It is a constant discussion for us. Um, we have some uh, pros and cons that we also have to evaluate. So Hitachi Ventures uh, as an entity is actually set up in uh, Munich, Germany. So we are headquartered out of Munich, Munich, Germany. And so we are governed by GDPR rules. And so when we, as much as we'd love to incorporate some of the AI tools, um, what we have found is some of the latest startups that are thinking about this are may not have some of the data compliance that, you know, adheres to GDPR. So that's always a, a checkpoint for us. But there are 
various ways where we try to incorporate um, sort of AI, um, you know, either in terms of deal sourcing itself. Um, but I have to say everything in kind of moderation at this point, just because of uh, where we are established. But we are constantly, we do look for tools um, in that segment. We are not building our own data science team at this point, uh, but we are looking at other uh, products and solutions that are in the market to see how best we can leverage them internally. And then how are you thinking about artificial intelligence and startups that you that you target? Are there any areas within AI? I mean, a lot of buzz around generative AI, right? It, it, you know, the discussions about how, you know, three major waves of innovation during our lifetime, sort of the internet, the iPhone and, and generative AI. And now, you know, massive advertising campaigns about co-piloting type technologies. How, how are you thinking about sort of generative AI and how that might, you know, how, how uh, are there are there particular areas within AI that that you find yourself drawn to? No, absolutely. And if you think about digital transformation and what's driving digital transformation today, it's largely AI and a big conversation today is centered around generative AI. Uh, so uh, we are looking at everything in that stack from infrastructure, infrastructure software to application software. Um, we also, uh, so right around the time I joined Hitachi, we were doing a big deep dive around generative AI specifically. And we looked at everything from uh, sort of the infrastructure layer all the way to the application layer. Um, we have invested in a company called Vecaio in the stor uh, storage domain um, in our in one of our previous funds. But um, we said, okay, storage is we think is going to be very critical. But then when you think about what's next, um, you know, we felt like networking would be a very uh, very important play from that standpoint, just because uh, all these uh, data sets, that, you know, historically when we're talking about smaller models. Um, if you remember, all the AI chips have like uh, direct SRAM access or memory access. But when you're talking about training large language models or foundation models, where the data sets may be somewhere else, um, the bottleneck for the training becomes a network. Uh, so we were looking at networking and we invested in a company called Arcus. Um, and since then, we've also started doing um, a bunch of earlier stage. So we have done three seed deals um, and all three are in the uh, generative AI space actually. Uh, unfortunately, they're not public yet, so I'm unable to share. But one that was uh, just announced was a company called Zaba, uh, which is in the cognitive robotics area. So it's right at the intersection of IT and OT. Um, the idea that industrial robots today um, have all the sensors and so on, but they don't really have the cognition piece. So when you tell them to do something, um, you know, in Zaba's case, oh, well, from point A to point B, they, they would do the welding, but they're not necessarily welding with the end product or the goal of the weld being, you know, a certain meet, meeting a certain requirement, standard requirement, right? They don't do that. So what Zaba has done is uh, added software that not only gives the path um, for the robot to move, but also making sure that the end output um, meets the quality requirements, right? So that way you avoid scrap and rework and so on. So uh, so there's wide areas. We're looking at everything, as I said, from hallucination management to, um, you know, a, a governance and safety all the way down to the infrastructure stack and sort of foundation models and so on. So pretty broad uh, scope. Uh, right now, we are also looking at the data stack and saying, what does the data pipeline look like in, in sort of this uh, Gen AI age? Um, what does that mean when somebody is building a Gen AI pipeline? Um, because now you're talking about structured and unstructured data coming together. Uh, you're not just using it for doing BI or analytics, but uh, you're actually using it for training or inference. Uh, so we're trying to understand what that pipeline looks like. And that's one thing we're looking at actively. Uh, you mentioned co-pilot. Uh, we are looking at both co-pilots and agents, autonomous agents as well as another sort of um, could autonomous agents be the next generation of RPA and how does that transform uh, sort of the workplace in terms of driving productivity and so on. So those are some of the areas that we are actively looking at. Of course, my um, some of my colleagues are much more focused on sort of application of AI in uh, climate or in industrial segments as well. So um, we, we cover quite that breadth. How much are you, have you researched uh, large language model generative AI acceleration? It seems to me that there's high performance computing 
companies out there that could have a significant impact on acceleration and speed's important, uh, response time is important. Uh, and you know we've made a significant investment into, into Cornami. Uh, we were one of the first investors in that company and now SoftBank and Applied Materials and Qualcomm have all co-invested. And there's been a lot of historical discussion about how AI might apply uh, to areas of cybersecurity like fully homomorphic encryption and others. But now I'm finding that Cornami and other portfolio companies are really starting to look at sort of acceleration of large language, uh, large language models and, and, uh, and generative AI. Are you, have you researched that space much? Uh, We've uh, not actively researched that space, but we have been given kind of my time and my plan where we also looked at uh, companies in that segment. We've, uh, we've been tracking that space, but we've not actively made any investment there. We do look for, as Hitachi, we look for, um, uh, relevance for Hitachi or how can uh, we add value to the companies that we invest in through Hitachi. Um, so when it comes to the infrastructure layer, we are we are also cognizant of, okay, what are the potential um, avenues for Hitachi to collaborate? And in, in some cases, it's strong. In some cases, it's not. So that's something that every time we look at a company, we kind of evaluate that to see, okay, we're not a, a big data center player, but we do have a big storage and systems play. We have um, SI angle, we have a reseller angle. And then of course we build rolling stock like in Hitachi Rail, or we have our own grids in the energy sector and so on. So we are, we are looking at that intersection of what could be meaningful for the startup and Hitachi, but also um, for us from a financial standpoint. So, uh, while we have looked at a lot of chip companies in that space, we have not pursued an investment to date because we are still trying to figure out what that right angle would be. When you source interesting opportunities, can you give us some visibility into what does the due diligence process look like as it relates to you know business unit sponsorship or you know how do you collaborate with these with these business units inside uh, Hitachi to sort of get some insight into you know whether you might make that investment and, and, and is BU is BU sponsorship even required for your investment? Maybe talk a little bit about that. Absolutely, Jack, and that's a great question because when it comes to corporate ventures, uh, corporate venturing, there's many flavors of them. Uh, the way we are set up, as I mentioned, we're set up as an ind uh, independent entity, so we do not require any commercial en engagements. We do not require any BU sponsorships or anything like that, but. We want to come in and add value to our portfolio companies and uh, Hitachi has over 700 subsidiaries or uh, businesses that they operate globally. So we want to see, okay, how can we leverage that power of Hitachi to these portfolio companies of ours? So that's the angle that we look at companies, but we don't necessarily require. So even if there is no immediate uh, engagement or even uh, sort of product or you know, any kind of uh, immediately obvious angle. But if this is something that Hitachi is thinking about, you know, playing an active role, either, um, you know, supporting the ecosystem, being a go-to-market partner or something like that, we would still consider. So, um, for instance, we've invested in a quantum-related uh, companies. So, so I would call it uh, quantum middleware, right? It's a company called Strangeworks. So we don't have any product to date within Hitachi, but Hitachi R&D is actively engaged with, with Strangeworks. So that's something that we do look for. It may not be something where we have um, any product commercially available today, but even if R&D is interested, that may be an angle. So we leverage the various business units more from a technical diligence standpoint. Um, think of, uh, uh, for instance, I get calls from other VCs to say, hey, I've been talking to this startup and is this something that Hitachi as an entity would like become a customer of? Or So we, we don't have to call a third party corporate. We do, of course, but Hitachi uh, itself becomes one of our uh, referenceable sort of customers or diligence partner, right? That we can call upon to check what's their perspective, how do they see the market and so on. That's kind of how we leverage the broader Hitachi. And then of course, post-investment, we do actively try to see if we can drive an engagement that's beneficial for both parties. Um, and for that, we work with our uh, counterparts called the Corporate Venturing Office. They're more of an open innovation team uh, that sits within Hitachi. Their KPIs are, draw, uh, are tied to collaboration with 
startups and portfolio companies of Hitachi Ventures. So uh, there is a strong alignment in driving this kind of companies within broader Hitachi ecosystem. And I'll have to add that because of that, even if the startup, if we don't invest in the startup, we do try to see where possible, at least we'll connect them to this uh, organization to drive any collaboration internally. Uh, but for portfolio companies, we'll of course go the extra mile because we ourselves become uh, a resource to help them in addition to the CBO as well. Sure, makes great sense. Do you find yourself mostly co-investing alongside of seed and early stage venture firms, late stage venture firms, or maybe even a concentration on other corporate venture groups? I mean, I, I think you and I might've been at a plug and play event years ago uh, where there was a, a, a large number of of corporate venture groups there and they talked about syndicating rounds of financing with each other on a more frequent basis. When you look at co-investors and, and you look at the kind of the track record of, of investments that you're making out at Hitachi Ventures, where who are you mostly co-investing with? That's a great question. I don't think we have like a specific, um, I, in my sort of portfolio company uh, companies, I wouldn't say there's like a specific group that I go back to, uh, but it, it largely varies, I think. And I do think that the syndicate is super important and critical. We are not the kind to say we we do, we are completely comfortable taking lead or co-lead positions or even follow. Uh, but at the same time, for companies success in the long term, we believe that building a strong syndi syndicate is very critical uh, because, the, you know, startups life, it's its like a cat's life. You almost feel like you're going to die many times before you're reborn. Um, and having that strong sort of syndicate of VCs who can support you during the good times and the bad, I think is really important. Um, so we do watch for that. And in, in situations where um, uh, we had the opportunity to build that syndicate. We do our best to do that. But if the syndicate's already formed, uh, then what what I uh, or we try to do is talk to all of the investors around the table, both existing and new, uh, to understand the level of commitment they have towards that company, because that also gives us a sense of how committed are the you know people around the board um, or the investors when when things get rough, right? Will they support continue to support the company? So from that perspective, it is uh, very important for us. Um, but as I said, I'm not uh, the scope of the investments have ranged quite widely, so it's not happened where um, I'm constantly co-investing with a certain group of people. So. Mm -hmm. We uh, let's talk about sourcing for a little bit. Uh, we review about 3,000 investment opportunities each year. Uh, we've done that since we launched our, our firm in 2017. Uh, we've made 34 investments and you've been the source of two of them. Uh, so your hit rate is extraordinary. Um, and so I need to learn a little bit more about how you're finding uh, these companies. Obviously we have um, uh, high regard and high respect for, for you and your ability to identify innovations that are relevant. Uh, those companies are now attracting follow on capital. So we're quite happy with the seed and early stage investments that that we made where where we point to you as the as the source. How are you doing it, G? You know, how, how are you finding these these interesting? I know you're particularly good at developing a, a wide network of relationships and paying attention to investment trends. But is there anything else that you'd point to with regard to your ability to source high quality investment opportunities? Well, um, I, I hope time will tell. I, I hope they're all high quality. But <laughs> uh, in terms of, um, it really depends on um, on the stage of the company. But I have to say that, um, Jack, you and I have talked about this. I think I have a strong leaning towards the team in general, um, because I feel like uh, at the end of the day, the team drives the success. Um, and the founding team, especially uh, their ability to navigate during those good times and bad are so important um, and how resilient they are as well. Some of these you can evaluate, some not so much. Um, so I would say I, I tend to bet much more on the on the team, even the two, two companies that you referred to. Um, I think they're very strong founder-led uh, companies, and that's kind of what drove my investments in those two, and especially with seed stage companies, I would say that's one of the key things that I look for is the team itself. Um, in terms of where do I source, it, it's combination, it's network. I do look for information, you know, 
online or keep my eyes and ears open. Um, and then once I he hear something, I also doggedly pursue just to at least have an opportunity for a seat at the table, just to even, you know, some of those hot deals is hard to even get in the door. So I try to at least see if we can, you know, be part of that early conversation at least, and then uh, have the ability to say yes or no for our own reasons. Um, I think it's been different over a course of time at Micron. We were a very small team. Um, here, the team is much bigger. So a lot of our analysts and associates also do uh, deal sourcing uh, on their own. So we get to, uh, you know, benefit from that as well. Uh, but I always revert to looking at the team and saying, okay, how do I feel about this team? Um, when things get rough, uh, do we think that they can handle it? Or um, And sometimes it's also about raising money at the right time and so on. So do they have the ability to do that? Right. So that's something that's important, I think. Going just, back to the syndicate too. Yeah, syndicate's pretty important, right? Uh, yeah, the quality of the syndicate's important. But I, I couldn't agree with you more about the, the founding team. Uh, we've had less success when you sort of you know, uh, bring in a hired gun or, or you start to try and build the team. Uh, there's something about the conviction of a founder uh, through the good times and the challenging times uh, to just make it to the other side and get to the next level. And so, yeah, we've had a very similar experience. As, as you're sourcing these opportunities and heavily weighting the team, you're also thinking about balancing sort of strategic implications for Hitachi and the investment return opportunity for you and the team um, at Hitachi Ventures. And then some level of impact focus, uh, positively impacting sort of the world with technology that we're all investing in. How do you balance those sort of three elements of your investment strategy? So um, I, I would say as boring as it sounds, probably financial first. And my fundamental belief is if you're set up as a fund, uh, if you don't show returns, then you know while your first early few funds may be easy um, to raise, your your subsequent funds will be a lot harder. So I always keep that in the back of the mind because showing quantitative proof of strategic value I've found is very hard. Um, so. Uh, you can say a lot of qualitative things that are feel good about the strategic value that a company brings, uh, but it's uh, very rare for you to be able to say, okay, this investment drove this, you know, millions of dollars in revenue or something like that. Uh, so that makes the strategic part a little hard or it's not as tangible enough. So I always focus on the financial and then try to drive um, the strategic synergies after after the fact. And I'll give an example. Um, ARC is the investment that I did in the networking um, startup. Initially, there was no real um, angle, but now we are seeing multiple venues of, you know, conversations between Hitachi and, um, and Arcus that did not exist before, but we have to be proactive in that, in that sense as well. Um, in terms of once they become portfolio, we, we go that extra mile to drive those, um, you know, strategic value or synergies between the portfolio company and the, um, startup. And then the third one impact, I'm, I'm always hoping that every company, given kind of our focus is on, you know, us as VCs, we are looking at sort of cutting edge next generation technology. I'm not worried about positive impact these days as much as negative impact, to be honest, especially with technologies like AI. I always wonder, um, okay, I hope my investments are adding net positive impact and not negative impact uh, as a mother of two kids and who you know born with screens it feels like uh, <laughs> screens attached to them or something like that I always worry about because that's the next generation that's going to be using these technologies once they hit mainstream right we are we are kind of if we think of our investments are uh, you know three five years ahead of mainstream uh, when you think about these kids kind of becoming adults the these technologies are going to be ingrained in their sort of day-to-day -day lives. And that's where I worry about, okay, I hope you're not causing sort of a negative impact. Um, and that's that's the more harder question for me these days uh, than the positive impact. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> gotta figure out robotic technology to pry the mobile phone out of my teenage daughter's hand. Uh, That's that, right. <laughs> the next great, great invention. Um, the, uh, as the world sort of evolves from social, socially responsible investments to, for a while, sort of embracing ESG to now the UN's embracing of a broader platform um, and I think more constructive platform in the sustainable development goals. I, I've noticed that some corporate venture groups are starting to color code um, their investments in line with the UN's framework for these sustainable development goals. Do you think about it in that way? Do you think about impact in that way or, or you're not really uh, sort of looking to check a box as you finalize an investment decision with regard to one of the SDGs? How do you think about it? It's a great question. No, we don't use that kind of like checking a box, but um, there's a strong debate within the teams as well, within the team as well, because as I mentioned, uh, uh, we have a team that's very active in the climate space. And then here I am investing in AI startups and you hear about sort of the compute, the energy consumption of these companies. And then you have to wonder, okay, uh, when you look at how much power hungry the AI models end up being. Um, and then on one end, we also talk about being uh, you know, investors in sustainability and climate tech and so on. Uh, so it kind of uh, gives us pause on, okay, uh, so that also drives some of our trends that conversations that we've had is uh, you asked about chip architectures and so on. So we've actually had those conversations around, hey, should we be looking at sort of those emerging architectures that are more power efficient, uh, that are making data centers more greener going forward, right? So um, that's, that's a classic overlap of what I'm looking at, which is, you know, technologies that drive tra digital transformation with the climate team that's looking at sustainable sort of technologies for the future. Uh, so we're, we, it drives those kind of interesting debates at this point, but I wouldn't say um, we are looking to check a box based on, um, you know, uh, the UN goals or anything like that. Okay. And then with regard to adding value beyond capital, you mentioned a little bit uh, about this earlier. It'd be great to just go into a little bit more detail. We're now... You know, we've now had an opportunity to co-invest alongside of Intel and Qualcomm and SK Hynix and Zoom and Yamaha and Kubota and Baidu and a bunch of other corporates along uh, along with uh, financial investors like SoftBank, USVP and Madrona. And we're we're looking at how those investors are adding value beyond capital. And it's it's clear that corporates are in a great position to provide market insight, co-development resources, uh, be a customer, be a partner, uh, obviously be a capital source, and then eventually be even a, a potential acquirer. Are there some of those areas that you lean into more? Are there other things that you do to add value to the founding teams that you invest in? The most obvious is how can we leverage Hitachi? That's the that's the first box that we try to check. Uh, because as I mentioned, when there are 700 business units, um, it, it can also flip the other way where it's like you don't want a, a giant sitting on top of a fledgling startup as well. So it's also the management of uh, when some company, uh, one of our startups actually, uh, that we just recently invested in gets a ton of interest. And if every business unit starts saying, hey, set up a call with that founder, uh, then pretty much that founder is going to be spending all his time talking to Hitachi and nobody else, right? So also managing that uh, behind the scenes, they may not be, um, they may not see it, but we do a lot of that work of screening, making sure that any, uh, you know, even intros that we make within the broader Hitachi organizations are, is meaningful, um, and how can we sort of ensure the right flow of information in both directions so that it's not overwhelming. Uh, so we take on some of that back end as well, because it's always easy to talk about all the good things you do, but, uh, you know, also shielding the company from sort of uh, overhead is also important, I think, especially for young companies. So we tend to do that as well. And then the other thing that we do lean into is the syndicate forming, right? So uh, especially if you're going in at a seed or a series A, and then there's subsequent rounds of funding that come about, we are much more active in sort of tapping into our network and making the introductions. And we don't wait for um, the company to be starting its next round. We always start, you know, thinking about it early, making those, you know, introductions early on so that the conversations can continue and then can always shift to a fundraising mode when the company is ready. By then, it gives the investors the opportunity to have seen the company's growth and uh, decide for themselves as well. 
like you, we're finding that we're spending an extraordinary amount of time making curated introductions um, to uh, customers, to investors, to media sources, uh, to executive talent uh, as they build out their team or build out the board of directors. Uh, so much so that we followed a playbook, the playbook that Intel Capital, I think, established of, of tracking uh, curated introductions so that we know how many you know, we actually made in a given year and then what, what was the end result? Are we actually adding the value that we, we, we think we are? So I think that may become best practices pretty quickly. Um, I was gonna ask about check size and ticket size. Can, can I uh, interrupt for a second? I know that I'm the one being interviewed, but I would love to learn more about the curated and how are you, are you using any specific tool to track uh, sort of who you're making the intros to and how, uh, because sometimes when we make an intro, um, and we don't keep on top of it to say, did you know, did this actually close or did this turn into some engagement or not? Uh, so would love to maybe also pick your brain either now or later on how you guys track it and how do you see that to closure? Um, We've evolved from, yeah, the snapshot is, I'm happy to share more details later. The snapshot is we evolved from Zoho to a CRM system called Affinity. And we not only use that to track um, not only all uh, we, we track all of our deal flow, we track all of our you know LPs and prospective right. LPs. But now we have a dedicated section um, where we're tracking these curated introductions, and it's sort of like uh, introduction meeting held, and then you know customer agreement signed or investment. It has these different toggle options in there where you can track exactly what happened. And what's very interesting is when you see wow, you've made an introduction to this particular corporate uh, five times with these, you know, with these different investors, look, with these different portfolio companies, look at how many of our portfolio companies are relevant to that one corporate investor. They, they sort of, that CVC ends up being a higher priority because you can see that there's so much overlap uh, between the industry sectors that you're targeting. The, the, the likelihood of a co-investment is very high. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. It's not a perfect system, but um, their uh, Lee Sessions was at Intel Capital for a while. You may know him. And he uh, developed a system there of, of kind of curating and, and tracking uh, uh, these, these introductions. So we sort of followed his lead. Uh, now he's, of course, at GCV um, and doing some great things for, for them. But I thought it was an instructional to, to see what they, what they had done and, and then to track the ultimate outcome. Of, right. of, of the introduction, right? Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Uh, ticket size. So are you, you know, let's talk a little bit about stage and, and ticket size so that the entrepreneurs and investors that watch this bring you uh, deals that are most relevant. Uh, can you talk about uh, stage and ticket size? Absolutely. Our sweet spot is Series A, Series B. But that said, we've gone in earlier and we've also gone later. Uh, we do look at the relevance as the benchmark. So, um, for instance, the networking startup that I mentioned, Arcus, was a Series D stage investment, uh, whereas Zaba, which was the robotics company, was a seed stage investment. Uh, we felt like uh, in Zaba's case, it may be interesting to uh, put a small check in. Uh, so it was out of our comfort zone. That's something new that we've started since I joined, actually, to do these uh, smaller seed deals. Um, our typical check sizes have been in the 2 to 10 kind of range. Um, but when it, uh, when it comes to seed, we won't lead. But we figured that's a good opportunity to maybe uh, get a foot in the door, watch how the companies are operating, and then maybe even lead their Series A going forward. Um, so that's kind of the approach that we took there. But even in Zaba's case, we found like multiple areas of overlap between Hitachi and the company. And so that kind of led us to make the investment. And similarly for um, Arcus, you know, networking was such an important area where we felt like it made sense, even though it was a late stage company. But ideally, we target the A and the B. Okay. And one last question for you on founders. Uh, I'm particularly struck by how much you're weighting the team, because we talk about that a lot at the pre-seed and seed stage level, right? You're really yeah, you can look at the, the overall market, but there isn't, you know, a huge amount of development on the technology yet. And the, there isn't yet product market fit or customer traction. So you really are betting on the decision making uh, capability um, uh, and skill set of, of the existing team. As you look at this, maybe the, the other characteristics, the other character traits and qualities, I mean, we're, we're, we're targeting groups that, you know, founders that have sales skills and oftentimes they have deep industry experience. Um, they're, they're active listeners, they're, they seem coachable, uh, they have conviction around uh, what they're doing. Oftentimes they've they made a, a personal investment themselves that was pretty significant or have family and friends that have made a personal investment. All of those start to align pretty well. 
as you look at founders in particular and, and, and qualities or character traits that you target, um, what's the pattern that you're seeing and in, in what resonates with you? I think uh, sort of good resilience is one thing that I always put up front. And it, that's one of the traits that are hard to kind of quantify or measure <clears throat> ahead of investment. Um, but the other is uh, willingness to be uh, not necessarily coached is, uh, is not the right. Uh, willingness to listen maybe is much better. Um, you don't need, you know, I, I don't think anyone... Um, can tell another founder how best to run their company. Uh, but I want the founder or the CEO to be open to listening. Uh, at the end of the day, the execution is their call and you have to give them credit that they're the ones who are going to bear the brunt of the outcome, whether it's positive or negative. Um, so they have to be given the ability to make that hard choice but you want a founder or you know the the management team uh, who can actually listen to your feedback and have a meaningful conversation uh, even if they disagree um, but being able to articulate why they agree or disagree I think is important and so that willingness to listen uh, with an open mind is something I think super important and then the next thing is willingness to ask for help when needed um, because you know you may be great early stage sort of getting a company from point a to point b uh, which is you know but the minute it comes to scaling the company maybe you're not the you know best person for it uh, but knowing that and saying hey i need help here and it's not about replacing the the ceo or anything like that but being able to surround that ceo with the right talent um, and for that the there should be a level of self-awareness and willingness to ask for help to say, hey, I've reached this point where I think I need this talent pool around me to, you know, take it to that next level. Um, that's something I think is equally important. Yeah, thanks for that feedback. That's actually very instructional for me in, in some of the conversations that we're having with founders. Um, that's very helpful. Uh, okay, we're going to shift to the rapid fire portion of the program, G. Uh, last two <laughs> questions before we wrap up. Um, I've just been impressed watching you and your professional career uh, recognized as a rising star in the corporate venture industry. Um, I've seen your high, uh, your, your high quality sourcing capabilities, uh, the thoughtful approach that you take to research, um, the stellar communication skills. I mean, you're doing a lot of things that I think I and others in the venture industry and corporate venture industry should work to emulate. Um, is there something from a professional excellence standpoint or, you know, as a high performing uh, um, investor at a, at a major corporate venture group that you find yourself doing on a regular basis so that you can sort of bring your, your, your A game uh, to, to investments. What, what, what kind of professional development activities are, are you focused on? So professionally, I think I, I would say more personal development. I, I think I'm still a work in progress, right? I don't think anyone is, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm, open enough to say that there's a lot more for me to learn, um, whether it's on a personal front or otherwise. So I'm constantly looking to see how can I improve myself. So um, I always, uh, we had our performance review internally and I was telling everyone, like all my partners and colleagues, I was asking them for feedback. I've been here for almost a year now. Uh, what, what should I start doing, stop doing or continue doing, right? Um, I, I had used that in the past and I continue to use that uh, as a way to gauge, okay, what, what, what comes naturally to me and what doesn't and uh, what should I work on essentially? Yeah, a three hundred six, a, a self-imposed three hundred sixty degree uh, survey. It sounds like you're, right. you're to just get some candid feedback. That's great. And then you you know what a fan I am of of looking at sort of strategic plans for life and how how we're living each day. I was going to ask you, uh, and I've had a chance to ask other guests, sort of how you launch your day from a personal standpoint. Are there any personal morning routines that you find? sort of help to clear out the cobwebs and, and sort of get you sort of intellectually and physically prepared for, for making each day a great day. Tell us about your sort of any morning routines that uh, you think help support your efforts. It's more the uh, the night before rather than the morning. Um, I proactively sort of look at what's ahead uh, for the day so that I'm mentally prepared for, okay, today is going to be a day full of meetings, uh, so I need to be in the right frame of mind. Or, okay, no, there's enough gaps in my schedule today that today is going to be more around research and here are the five things I'd like to work 
three things that I'd like to get done before the end of the day because I have those breaks. Uh, that's something that I do. Um, in terms of sort of uh, working on improving myself um, and aligned with the morning, I, I have been uh, trying to do yoga off late in the mornings. Um, I do feel like it, uh, tr it helps calm me, but also activate me to some extent on the task human platform actually so um uh, but uh, i have to say um my mind's literally like uh, like a monkey can't seem to settle so i'm hoping the yoga will help <laughs> <laughs> that's great well on behalf of the team at impact venture capital and the kaufman fellows thank you g so much for spending some time with us today we really appreciate it